grateful to be here today. My name is Tom Christensen. I'm the uh, professor of international and public affairs at Columbia University. I'm also the director of the China in the World program. We have a special event today for the Weather, Weatherhead East Asia Institute and for the China in the World program. Uh, we have an esteemed guest. Uh, B. Kim Xiao is the uh, representative from Taiwan in the United States. She uh, directs the Taiwan Economic, Cultural and Representative Office. She is Taiwan's top diplomat in the United States. And she has held uh, several positions in the past uh, of great importance, uh, including being uh, a leading advisor to the current president Tsai Ing-wen on international affairs for years, uh, for the Democratic Progressive Party in Taiwan for years. And she's been elected to the legislature on, on uh, several occasions, most recently representing uh, the Eastern District of Hualien in Taiwan. And uh, she started here this year as our representative. She was a great choice, in my opinion, as uh, the representative uh, for Taiwan in the United States. She has tremendous experience in the United States. And uh, she went to college at Oberlin College. And we're very proud at Columbia University to note that she has a master's degree from Columbia University. Uh, she's an esteemed alum. Uh, she is someone I've known since the 1990s. Uh, she's greatly respected in Washington, and she was a perfect choice by President Tsai uh, to represent Taiwan here in the United States. And it's a tremendous honor for me to uh, to introduce uh, Representative Xiao to you, and I will turn it over to her for some initial comments, uh, and then I will ha have a conversation with her based on some questions we prepared. Well, thank you, um, Professor Christensen, for that introduction. And it's a pleasure to have uh, known you for so many years. And I want to thank you for hosting today's event, of course, and all the many uh, students and scholars who have joined us online. Um, I'm honored to be here on behalf of Taiwan to uh, represent uh, my country uh, in the United States. And um, I also want to thank Columbia University, of course, my alma mater, as you um, introduced uh, for hosting this event. It does mean a lot to me. And I was just um, thinking back and it's been exactly 25 years since I uh, left Columbia as a student, um, abandoning my uh, PhD program uh, less than halfway through in favor of actual involvement in politics uh, over being a full-time student of politics. But of course, throughout my political career, I have continued to be interested in learning about public policy, and I have really appreciated and enjoyed the many opportunities to engage with um, students and scholars alike. Um, this uh, pandemic has brought now, many challenges and opportunities uh, to our life and to our work uh, here in the United States. Um, but thanks to technology, while our in-person interaction uh, and being on campus in person is limited uh, by the current situation, we can still exchange our thoughts virtually. Um, and when I graduated or when I left Columbia in 95, Taiwan's democracy was still young and we were just about to have our first ever um, direct presidential election. Of course, Taiwan is very different today and the world is also different now. But with the tireless efforts of the Taiwanese people, uh, we have built one of the most vibrant economies and uh, um, made Taiwan a beacon of democracy and um, as one of the most liberal and open societies in the region. Um, Taiwan's COVID-19 success story has actually attracted a lot of world attention this year, and uh, more like-minded countries have shown their support for Taiwan's international participation. The relations between Taiwan and the U.S. based on our shared values are stronger than ever. Um, this past August, um, Health and Human Service uh, Secretary Azar and uh, Under Secretary of State for Economic Growth, Energy and Environment, Keith Kroc, um, have visited Taiwan, demonstrating the robust relations between Taiwan and the United States. Um, their visits have also opened the doors of cooperation on health care and, of course, economic relations uh, between our two countries. My appointment to Washington, D.C. comes at a very important time in Taiwan-U.S. relations, and 
facing these challenges, I'm particularly grateful uh, to Columbia that helped prepare me for a career in understanding public policy. Deepening economic and security cooperation are my immediate priorities here, but education exchanges and public outreach are also important parts of my agenda. By bridging the people of our two countries and understanding between the two, I believe that our partnership will continue to thrive and our bonds will further be strengthened. So again, thank you for joining me today. And um, I am looking for a fruitful discussion with Professor Christensen as well as with everyone else here online. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Representative Shao. We really appreciate your opening comments. And I wanted to uh, push you along the same direction by pointing out that uh, there does seem to be uh, changes in the economic and security relationship between the U.S. And, and Taiwan. And I wanted to start with the economic piece because when I was a government official, we worked on this. Uh, and it seems to me that uh, the economic uh, relationship has always been very deep, uh, especially in trade and investment between the United States and Taiwan. But there have been efforts by uh, previous administrations to improve economic relations between the U.S. and Taiwan. And there have even been discussion in the past about moving in the direction of a free trade agreement. And I know Under Secretary uh, Kroc was there uh, recently to discuss such issues in, in Taipei, which is a real sign that there's been uh, some progress on that score. But some of the challenges that we faced in the past have always been the agricultural sector uh, related to the importation of pork and beef. And uh, those were always a major roadblock in uh, deepening the U.S.-Taiwan economic relationship. And on top of that, now we have somewhat of a protectionist strand in U.S. politics uh, that probably doesn't make uh, many politicians eager to sign new trade agreements. So I wanted to ask you, uh, how are things going on that score? Are we moving in the proper direction on U.S.-Taiwan economic uh, relationship and its deepening? And how can we overcome some of those domestic political hurdles, both in Taiwan and in the United States, to uh, to reach uh, better agreements? Well, um, I think you're right to point out that our two governments have been discussing the intention to strengthen trade relations for a long time. And um, when you were in government, which was over a decade ago, um, you know this the issue of a possible agreement uh, was brought up. Um, but um, we have been encountering some difficult hurdles in the agricultural sector, uh, namely uh, beef and pork market access issues. And so this has been a long standing issue. It's not a new issue. And numerous governments um, in the US and in Taiwan have been dealing with this without a lot of success. But uh, in order to demonstrate a resolve to further integrate Taiwan's economy with global economy, as well as strengthen Taiwan's trade relations with other major economic partners. Um, President Tsai announced in late August that our government will be um, working on opening up market access to beef and pork, uh, specifically dealing with the um, long-standing dispute on the chemical additive ractopamine and also um, restrictions on beef um, from cattle over 30 months of age. Um, so these, although in terms of our overall trade relationship, uh, do not constitute a large volume, but politically they have been very difficult issues. And that's why we have lived through and witnessed numerous administrations coming and going on both sides, but uh, without much agreement in how to proceed. Now, President Tsai's demonstration of a resolve uh, is not only uh, relevant for these issues, but I think in the long run, it is a demonstration of Taiwan's linking its economy to global trading standards and meeting those trading standards uh, in a scientific way. And this has been the longtime expectation of many of our trading partners. And our hope and expectation is that this demonstration of our resolve uh, will uh, initiate some interest on part of our other major trading partners to enter into agreements that would further facilitate uh, trade between Taiwan and these partners. 
Um, Taiwan does depend significantly on external trade relations. Our domestic market of 23 million people, citizens, uh, is very significant, but not large enough to sustain long-term economic growth. And uh, it is paramount that we have uh, trade relations that are mutually beneficial and mutually complementary with other partners. And so our hope is that it will generate some interest. Um, at the moment, um, many members of the administration have uh, responded positively to Taiwan's gesture of um, dealing with these agricultural access issues. Um, many members of Congress also, uh, just a few days ago, 50 bipartisan members of the Senate and uh, wrote a joint letter to Ambassador Lighthizer indicating their support for initiating discussions on a formal trade uh, deal. And as you and I and many people online here know, it's not easy to get bipartisan agreement uh, on uh, matters here in Washington. It's not easy in Taiwan either, but the fact that uh, uh, half of the Senate uh, across party lines um, are actually supportive, I think that is very significant. And uh, so we are dealing with the implementation of President Tsai's announcement, and we are communicating further uh, how we intend to implement. Of course, there are some domestic political complications. Um, it is a domestic issue here in the U.S., and it is a domestic political issue in Taiwan as well. There are many different views in Taiwan about this matter um, from the agricultural sectors, but also from the those on you know, food safety perspectives. There are also different political perspectives uh, on this issue as well. And we are communicating on both sides in resolving this in a way that helps um, our country's trade relationship proceed in a positive way. Thanks very much. It's uh, encouraging to hear because we worked very hard on it for a long time. And uh, it's really encouraging to hear this progress on it despite the challenges. And um, I wish you luck in dealing with the uh, various domestic political obstacles. On the um, general relationship, you'd also mentioned, uh, in addition to uh, the common values between the United States and Taiwan, which run deep, uh, we have a security partnership and have for a, a long time. Uh, I think one of the many things that the United States and Taiwan share is a concern about uh, the People's Republic of China's military modernization, and its military posture uh, toward the region, including Taiwan. And I was hoping that you could perhaps comment a bit about uh, trends in the U.S.-Taiwan security relationship, uh, challenges you see in the U.S.-Taiwan security relationship, and um, what you see as the appropriate role of uh, Taiwan's uh, self-defense forces in providing greater security, what is the proper role of the United States uh, in assisting in that process. Um, I know that one of our uh, one of our attendees sent in a question asking how much Taiwan can rely on the United States uh, in a in a crisis or in a conflict, uh, and I just uh, add that to my own question to see uh, what your response might be. Well, um, Taiwan's security is certainly critical to our survival, um, especially to the survival of our democracy. Taiwan's security is also critical to the stability um, of the uh, Asia-Pacific region. And uh, in that light, I do believe that Taiwan's security is very much in the interest of the United States, as well as other countries uh, in the area. So uh, we do uh, intend to play our responsibility and to shoulder that uh, in maintaining adequate defense forces and deterrence against uh, any attempt to destabilize the region. Um, our security and defense cooperation uh, with the United States is based on the Taiwan Relations Act and the six assurances, uh, which have by and large remained consistent uh, since the early 1980s. Um, the, of course, the part of the six assurances involves um, a degree of security and defense cooperation that um, 
depends on the actual threat that Taiwan faces. And I do have to point out that, and also as, as you uh, pointed out, the PLA's modernization program has accelerated over recent decades. And today we are facing a very different uh, security environment. Uh, over the last few weeks, the PLA has taken a number of very provocative uh, moves in terms of um, intrusions into Taiwan's ADIZ, or our Air Defense Identification Zone, um, also increased uh, naval activity um, on the eastern side of eastern coast of Taiwan is also um, quite alarming. Now we, um, of course, our priority in our defense is to secure um, Taiwan's uh, survivability. And uh, the U.S. is a global superpower, and that's, I think, where we differ in terms of how we approach um, the um, security and defense issues. Uh, however, we are aligned in our interest in ensuring that stability remains in the region. Um, in terms of our bilateral defense relationship, there are different components of that. One involves the provision of adequate defensive items, uh, which Taiwan needs. And in this, we are engaged in intensive conversations over the threat picture, over what Taiwan perceives uh, we need as a priority in terms of defense items, and what the U.S. Uh, believes are the priorities. And sometimes uh, that we it requires some efforts at synchronization, uh, but we do have very uh, fluid fluid communications and uh, intensive uh, conversations on how to proceed in our overall defense concept, which is primarily an asymmetrical warfare strategy in light of China's increasing investments and the PLA's modernization. We are not interested in an arms race. Uh, we are not interested in competing over the size of our military um, or the number of the defense or um, um, military equipment uh, that we have. Uh, instead, we need an asymmetrical strategy which poses an a, def a deterrent uh, to the PRC against um, destabilizing and unilaterally um, destabilizing the region and their provocations against Taiwan. And uh, so as long as the PRC does not renounce the use of force uh, towards Taiwan, we will have to continue on this strategy of uh, making it very difficult and unpalatable uh, for the PRC or anyone else uh, to, fight, to try to use military means to resolve disputes with Taiwan. Uh, so there is an ongoing um, defense cooperation relationship on the defense items and um, security front there. But there are some other areas, um, some new uh, gray zone concerns about the possibility of or the risk of escalation out of miscalculation and close encounters, the fact that the PRC or the PLA Air Force is coming closer to the Taiwan uh, surrounding airspace that they have been crossing the median line, that compels the Taiwan Air Force to respond accordingly to uh, make interception um, responses. And in those close encounters, uh, there certainly are risks involved, um, but we hope that um, the PRC will restrain itself in terms of um, an understanding that it is in no one's interest to engage in conflict um, right now. And so we you know, hope that ongoing communication of intentions and of actions uh, in the region are very important. Another sphere related to our security is in the cognitive space. And a lot of um, political warfare attacks on dis use, using disinformation or weaponizing fake news and information uh, with a goal of destabilizing our society and generating internal conflict, confrontation, and 
um, challenging public confidence in our political system. I think all of these are also um, ongoing security challenges that we are facing. Another sphere involves the cyberspace. Um, there have been attempts to attack our critical infrastructure uh, in the cyberspace sphere. And so more intensified cooperation on an international um, scale is required to deal with that. And uh, on this front, we have seen the U.S. actually with a number of um, initiatives on a global level to deal with um, the cyberspace security, as well as in new technologies, communication, infrastructure, et cetera. And uh, this is very much part of the conversation on the overall security and defense um, area. Thanks very much for the comprehensive answer. Um... I, uh, I'm interested in uh, your government's view of uh, US PRC tensions in general. And I ask this with a backdrop of having traveled to Taiwan in 2019 and having uh, met uh, your leaders and many of your academics and scholars. And um, at that time, the trade war between the United States and China was, uh, was, was uh, getting uh, deeper, uh, more conflictual. And uh, at that time, uh, U.S. PRC uh, security relations were already uh, uh, becoming more tense. And since then, uh, there haven't been massive improvements. There was the uh, phase one trade agreement. It's unclear how that will work out. Um, and there's still a very tense economic relationship and, and an even more intense uh, security competition between the United States and the People's Republic of China. I was just wondering, uh, knowing that Taiwan is both uh, a friend and a partner of the United States uh, and a neighbor uh, of uh, uh, the People's Republic of China and has very deep economic ties to the People's Republic of China, how does your government view U.S. PRC relations, the trend lines in U.S. PRC relations, and what would you like to see in U.S. PRC relations from Taiwan's perspective? <laughs> Well, that's a very big question, and there are different dimensions of the U.S. PRC relations. There is the security side, the economic side, and of course, many other areas, um, public policy issues such as um, climate change and, and um, health care and other areas of um, interaction, of course. And so I think it's hard to really characterize um, this relationship in just a few words. Um, I just spoke about our security concern, and um, I think the lines are very clear there, and that is we uh, will not tolerate any upsetting of the status quo by means of force. And that is why we need to further work with the United States on deterrent, an effective deterrent strategy. And in that line, um, a U.S. presence and commitment uh, to the security of the region at large is absolutely important. Of course, U.S. PRC tensions are certainly not limited to the Taiwan Strait area. They are so much broader on a global level, but in the region, we are seeing tensions in the South China Sea, um, in um, India, the Indian border, and to some extent also in disputed waters, uh, those that are disputed between Taiwan, Japan, and uh, the PRC. And um, certainly our interest is in a peaceful resolution of uh, all of these disputes. And so um, President Tsai has, since coming to office in 2016, has uh, tried to manage a very careful balance uh, in our relations um, in maintaining a peaceful and secure environment while further developing our relations with like-minded partners and ensuring that our deterrence um, is strong enough or to a level that is credible. And uh, that certainly does require um, a willingness on part of the United States to work with us. And I think I I went into, you know, elaborated more on that in the previous question. Yeah. Now, the economic side is a lot more complicated, uh, and it is very ironic that we have such intensive economic relations uh, with the PRC while they also um, have the threat to use force against Taiwan. And um, it, it is the complication of the economic relationship and the fact that 
Um, this, the PRC is actually Taiwan's largest trading partner still, despite the security and political complication. Um, we have had a diversification strategy over recent years, and part of that, um, first I want to say our intention is not in complete decoupling from the PRC because that is not realistic. Uh, our economic relations um, are very comprehensive uh, with the mainland. Um, however, uh, out of our um, broader strategic needs, um, we do have to diversify our economic relations. And that is partly why we are seeking a southbound policy, strengthening ties with Southeast Asia, and of course, with other major trading partners like the US, Japan, Australia, India, uh, the EU, and others. Um, the US-China trade dispute does have consequences for Taiwan. Um, especially on the technology side, because many of our companies have had market interests both in the PRC and the United States. Um, some are more um, leaning towards one side or another, but um, the, uh, the, the arising security concern over the integrity of technology uh, is something that we also share in the long-term perspective. Um, the defense of our IPR, the defense of privacy issues, the defense of technology as it is in as, as it is used in human progress instead of being used as a means to control um, our citizens or to exercise oppression uh, as it has occurred in China um, with the Uyghurs and with the Chinese citizens and also in Hong Kong. That is very alarming. And so I do think we share a vision in the sense that we need to work together to um, protect the integrity of technology. But at the same time, um, it is complicated because we do have uh, market interests uh, in China as well. And um, achieving a balance in that is a, a sophisticated act, but um, we have very resilient private enterprises that have managed to survive through decades of adversity, international marginalization, and uh, political and economic coercion. And um, our private sector is certainly finding uh, their ways of survival. But I think as a government, what we can do is to facilitate a process of diversification in helping to um, alleviate some of the risk factors that arise from over-concentration in a single market by creating the infrastructure needed to facilitate a balanced uh, global trade relations with other economies. And that is why we are quite eager to pursue uh, global trade relations based on high-end standards, including um, a, a trade agreement with the United States. Thanks very much. And I, I, I raised that question because I want, especially if students are, are participating, to have them understand the complex situation that you described, that uh, the PRC can pose a security challenge to Taiwan, but it's also a major economic partner of Taiwan. And that creates a very complex environment. I was struck in January 2019 uh, how people across the political spectrum in Taiwan were nervous about the U.S.-Taiwan trade disputes, uh, despite the security relationship, because Taiwan's economy could be harmed uh, in, a, in a spiraling of U.S.-Taiwan uh, trade disputes, uh, because Taiwan's integrated in a globalized economy. So it's a big challenge. And on that note, I wanted to move on to a different question, and it's related to something you said earlier about President Tsai's strategy uh, to uh, balance uh, various aspects of Taiwan's economic and security reality since she took office in 2016. And I'll just say as an editorial note, I think she's been very strategic, very moderate, and very smart in how she approaches uh, these challenges. And one of the things I wanted to ask you is about, is about my own country, and you're the uh, number one uh, diplomat to the United States, and you have to deal with Americans. Uh, Americans can be difficult. Um, and um, and the one thing I can say about the United States and Taiwan with great certainty is that there is a broad bipartisan support across the spectrum in the United States in support of Taiwan. Uh, everybody loves Taiwan and the United States just about. 
and everybody wants to support Taiwan in one way or the other. Uh, but in recent months, uh, there have been various initiatives uh, in Washington uh, in support of Taiwan, uh, nominally in support of Taiwan, saying we should support Taiwan more than we have in the past, um, and that the United States should perhaps recognize Taiwan diplomatically. And uh, this would run against a long-running uh, U.S. policy towards Taiwan. And as I said, I think President Tsai has been very strategic and moderate in her approach uh, towards mainland China and uh, in her relations with the United States. And I wonder, especially in light of uh, Foreign Minister Joseph Wu, who was uh, in your position when I was in the government and was the, was the representative uh, from Taiwan to the United States at that time, he recently said that uh, Taipei is not pursuing uh, uh, comprehensive diplomatic relations with the United States at this time. I wonder if there are certain initiatives pushed by American politicians, particularly on Capitol Hill, that have a spirit of support for Taiwan, but might be seen in Taipei as somewhat dangerous to Taiwan's own interests, perhaps uh, leading to a reaction uh, in uh, mainland China uh, that could in, uh, endanger ta Taiwan, make it less secure. Um, and how can you handle those issues as a diplomat from Taipei in the United States when the spirit behind the initiatives is really supportive, uh, but the actual content of uh, the bill or proposal uh, or um, uh, sense of the Congress resolution uh, might actually run against Taiwan's actual interests? Well, um, again, this is a very complicated and broad question. And I want to sir, first lay out a few um, basic positions. And first is that I do believe that President Tsai's cautious uh, balance uh, in her, um, in, in the strategic uh, environment has led to um, very strong confidence here in the United States. And that is also one of the foundations or the reason why the U.S. government has been able to take steps further to engage and to support Taiwan. And uh, so I think it's an interactive process. Um, confidence building and support um, is actually a necessary process. Um, and the second point I want to lay out is that, um, or a, a basic position is that, you know, in the U.S., we try to work with um, bipartisan um, friends here. Um, we we have friends on both sides of the political ally, especially on Capitol Hill, um, while we build confidence, of course, with the administration. And the third point is uh, we do thank the many initiatives uh, made by members of Congress and their vocal or actual support uh, for Taiwan in many ways. Um, and but you know this forms the context of what I, I think um, how we or or how we manage our further relations with the U.S. Um, the matter of um, making breakthroughs in our political relationship I think has been a hope and aspiration of many Taiwanese people. And just yesterday, our uh, legislature passed a resolution. Uh, raised by the um, KMT party, but that was supported unanimously um, in uh, urging the government to pursue uh, further uh, political relations. And I, I want to say that the pursuit of these relations takes place in a geostrategic environment, and we do require those conditions to be in place uh, for progress uh, to be made. And so while it is certainly a hope and aspiration of many Taiwanese people that uh, we are treated in a fair way, that we are included uh, in the international community with dignity, that we can participate in international organizations, that we are treated fairly, um, that we are no longer marginalized. I mean, all of these hopes do constitute our overall aspiration. And uh, to achieve these goals, again, we do have to operate in a very complex geostrategic environment. And um, of course, part of making progress involves working on the different elements that do influence the broad broader geostrategic space. And that is part of what the balancing um, um, effort that President Tsai has been so carefully um, 
uh, pursuing uh, during her first and now her second term in office uh, is also trying to achieve. Well, thanks a lot. Just let me follow up on that because I, I again, I agree entirely about President Tsai's strategy and I do recognize that it is widely appreciated in Washington, the approach she has taken towards uh, cross strait relations and the relationship with the United States. I'm just wondering if you ever have to sit down with a uh, self-proclaimed friend of Taiwan in Washington and say, I really appreciate the spirit behind what you're proposing, but this, uh, if adopted, this would cause more trouble for Taiwan uh, than it is worth, and how you carry out such conversations as a diplomat. I was a diplomat once, and I know things can be tricky, particularly when someone is already kind of on your side and, you, and you're trying to, uh, trying to uh, affect the way that that actor um, uh, proceeds? Actually, to tell the truth, I haven't had to sit down and have that type of conversation um, yet. We have very um, good communication with the administration um, that and the administration has been supportive of Taiwan in ways that are very much welcomed. Um, as I said in the opening, Secretary Azar's trip that highlights Taiwan's success in healthcare and in our fight against the pandemic. Under Secretary Kroc, uh, who was in Taiwan to attend the memorial of our former President Li, um, and that highlights Taiwan's accomplishments in the area of democracy. And so I think these are areas where we certainly seek to further pursue our relations. Um, I do have a lot of conversations with members of Capitol Hill. I would like to do it more often, but the pandemic is really getting in the way. And the fact that yeah. many members are in the middle of political campaigns. I was I used to be a politician myself, and I know how political campaigns do intervene in um the process of engaging with foreign governments. And I have had dozens and dozens of phone calls with members uh, so far, but um, certainly we do want to reach out to more uh, in the interest of uh, exchanging views on what is uh, feasible um, in the geostrategic environment and uh, what is in the best interest of both of our countries as, as we move ahead in deepening our relations. Thanks so much. Um, I, I wanted to ask you a question about uh, Secretary Azar's trip and about COVID. And before I do, I'll, I'll make another editorial mm -hmm. comment that I wanted to congratulate uh, uh, President Tsai's administration and the people of Taiwan uh, for their tremendous performance uh, during the pandemic. Um, and uh, I'll be frank, uh, I don't think I'll make another editorial comment. I don't think my own country has done very well. Uh, during the pandemic, and I'm wondering uh, what advice uh, can you draw from Taiwan's lessons uh, for the United States moving forward since we haven't done nearly as well as Taiwan. And Taiwan is a liberal democracy. Uh, it's not an authoritarian state. It doesn't have any special government controls over people, yet it has uh, rallied itself in a way that has protected the people of Taiwan from this pandemic uh, very successfully. And um, I'm afraid that my own liberal democracy has not done very uh, nearly as well. And I was hoping that you might have some suggestions for uh, Americans about how we can proceed. Well, um, I, I think what the main difference between Taiwan and the U.S. There's some commonalities. That is, we are open, liberal, democratic governments, and um, there is an expectation from our public that we are transparent about information. Uh, that our health institutions, our scientists, are involved in the process. That is certainly a common public expectation. But I think one main difference is Taiwan had an early start. Uh, we had a head start uh, in dealing with the pandemic that really was critical in limiting community transmission and the spread at a very early stage. Um, we were alert by uh, towards last um, in in last December, and we started implementing measures, quarantine measures, of, as well as other restrictions uh, in January and. Um, that was, I think, important. And part of um, the reason for that is because we lived through a very difficult SARS uh, 
uh, period in 2003. And so our society was very much on high alert at an early stage and quite willing to cooperate in terms of um, our command center's uh, advice and demands that uh, mask wearing in public transportation and in gatherings, uh, restrictions, et cetera, uh, were put into place. But we have been fairly successful in dealing with it in the sense that we have kept all of our schools open uh, throughout the process. Uh, all, most of our businesses have remained open as well. And so economically, uh, we are impacted negatively, but not as seriously as it has um, impacted some other countries. Um, and uh, we have also used uh, some digital tools in terms of the quarantine process, especially that has been a critical part of containing uh, the spread of the pandemic. Um, PPEs and um, uh, targeted quarantine, not quarantining the entire population, but targeted high risk individuals who have been exposed to the virus or who come from high risk areas. And uh, we have very strict border controls uh, still ongoing. And so all of these add to, um, uh, as of now, a relative success in um, controlling the pandemic. The U.S. is at a very different stage now and probably would pursue a different strategy, but we do hope that um, we can cooperate in the area of vaccine development, production, distribution, and of course, in future measures on a global level uh, as we um, Gradually, hopefully, um, we can soon move into an, a phase where international travel can um, return in a safe way uh, so that countries like ours that does depend heavily on international trade, international engagement, and um, um, visits, um, travel, tourism, all of that um, can resume to a degree of normalcy. So uh, there certainly is a lot of, of, of room for further cooperation. And um, Secretary Azar's visit was an important highlight of that process of cooperating. But I think um, symbolically for the people of Taiwan, highlighting Taiwan's success, which is often ignored or marginalized as Taiwan continues to be excluded from the WHA and the World Health Organization and its affiliate agencies, um, that uh, continues to be a problem. And we do thank the U.S., although it has declared its own withdrawal, but it does, um, to the extent that's possible, um, continue to support Taiwan's participation. Thanks very much. Um... We only have uh, several minutes left, and I wanted to turn the conversation toward you, uh, uh, Representative mm -hmm. Dow, because uh, you are an esteemed alum of Columbia University. We have uh, many students who tune in to these, um, to these uh, meetings, and I want wanted you to say something about your own journey and maybe if you could give some inspirational advice to uh, students at Columbia today about how they can move from being a master's student uh, at Columbia University uh, to becoming uh, a successful advisor to the top leadership of your party, to becoming a successful uh, legislator, uh, 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 elected official, uh, to becoming uh, a top diplomat uh, um, in Taiwan. Um. I think doing politics is so much more complicated than studying politics. And um, when I um, decided to leave the academia to pursue uh, actual involvement and work in public life in Taiwan, um, I did that at a relative early age. And it was a time when Taiwan was going through rapid political and democratic change. Uh, as I said, I returned to Taiwan the year that uh, we had our first presidential election. Uh, it was also a year that Taiwan was threatened by missile exercises uh, around uh, the surrounding Taiwan Strait area. And uh, so it was a time where a strong commitment, uh, despite adversity uh, towards political change in Taiwan, 
Taiwan was significant. And I made a choice to spend um, my, um, I wouldn't say youth, but my, my 20s uh, in the middle of political activism rather than the libraries of Columbia University. But I do admire those who stay in the program and who do actually um, uh, form a intellectual, a strong intellectual foundation uh, for dealing with the complexities of public policy. And I do think there's a value in in both types of careers. You know, those who who analyze the situation, who have a degree of objectivity rather than a personal entrenchment in the daily um, challenges of political life. But on the other hand, um, it is also important that uh, people are willing to um, you know, put themselves in some complicated waters and sometimes dangerous and risky as well um, as a commitment to pursuing a longer term goals. And uh, for, for my generation, I think that was to see Taiwan democratize. And uh, over the years, my um, as Taiwan has achieved a degree of basic freedoms and democratization, uh, my goal evolved to uh, trying to secure fair treatment of Taiwan internationally and more international space for Taiwan. And to that extent, I think my experience as at Columbia was actually very rewarding because it does provide an intellectual foundation or a basis to understanding both societies and for communicating with policy thinkers and policy makers. And um, so, so yeah, politics actually, um, once you're in it, it's very different from studying it. <laughs> and there's certainly very different challenges, um, especially in running elections and, and realizing that you're confronting problems so much more serious than what could ever appear in textbooks um, anecdotally. But, um, but I, I think it's a rewarding experience. And I think anyone pursuing public life um, does not arrive at um, senior positions without going through some frustrations and failures in the process. And I have come to learn that uh, every frustration or every setback is actually a lesson uh, in making ourselves stronger, in adjusting our strategies and in moving ahead. Um, I've certainly become um, I would say in my early days, I was so much more idealistic and um, years of hardship has worn me down. Um, but understanding more of the realities is part of uh, confronting those and dealing with those challenges. And so so that is you know, certainly part of political life. But I, I am grateful uh, to the academic and intellectual environment, to Columbia, but also to my other alma mater, that was Oberlin College in Ohio, and the combination of that uh, with Columbia in um, forming my understanding of US policy and and a public debate. So, you know, revisiting this setting today does bring back those memories. And, and again, thank you for putting this together. Thank you so much, Representative Chow. It's uh, great to see uh, see you again. Uh, I wish it was in, in person rather than on uh, on a computer. Um, we're really honored to have you here today. And I just wanted to say a few things in closing. And one is that uh, what I said at the introduction. I think uh, President Tsai uh, showed herself as a strategist again by choosing you as the representative uh, to the United States. Uh, you have tremendous experience, and as you just said, uh, I don't think you your your values were compromised or worn down. I think you were, have been steeled uh, through your experience, and you're a perfect fortified, yeah. fortified, fortified, <laughs> steeled. Uh, so um, you you, uh, you you are a perfect representative of Taiwan in the United States at an important time. And I just say for uh, my students' sake that when I was in in the in the U.S. government, people had a phrase about Taiwan that I always struck out of every memo. Uh, they used the term "the Taiwan problem," usually in reference to the United States and the PRC. And I used to always strike that down in every uh, memo, and I'd say Taiwan is not a problem. Taiwan is a friend. Taiwan is a democracy, and Taiwan is a miracle. And uh, I really believe that, and I hope that the U.S. Taiwan relationship will strengthen. And I know it's in good hands with uh, you as uh, President Tsai's representative in the United States. So thank you again. And 
again, we're honored by your presence and uh, please uh, plan to come back in the future, hopefully in person uh, when we get through this pandemic. Thanks again. Great to see you, Kim. Well, thanks to you, all of you, and I certainly hope to um, revisit um, Columbia uh, in person sometime in the near future, too. Thank you.